Come on, if your mama didn't raise no quitter, give me an amen. Let this house not be a house of quitters. How about we stand up and just honor the Word of God as I read this morning. I'm going to read two passages out of the book of Romans. I'm going to start in Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read a little bit in Romans chapter 8. But you'll remember last week we talked about that message, don't come off the ice. And we talked about faithfulness in the waiting, faithfulness in the storm, faithfulness to have faith. And then we had faithfulness that is costly. And I'm going to kind of continue with some of that perseverance style message this morning. Obviously, you get that if I titled it, Mama Didn't Raise No Quitter. But it's important that you hear this before I read the text. That I told you last week, Jesus' words said, those who endure till the end shall be saved. You and I have to endure to the end. We've got to finish this race. And I want you to know that you're not a quitter. Romans chapter 5, let's read it together. It'll be on the screen. I'm reading the New King James Version this morning. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, and you're very familiar with it. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Pray with me before you sit down. Lord Jesus, I pray that you open our ears to hear what the Spirit would have to say. And God, open our eyes to begin to see into the text, see into our life, see into the culture around us, to see what you would have us to see this morning. And I just simply want to be a conduit this morning that you move through, Lord. Let my words be your words. Put a filter over my mouth to say nothing but what you once said this morning. May our lives respond in faith to the word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So on a message like this, Mama Didn't Raise No Quitter, I need to begin by telling you a story about my mama. So I really wasn't old enough to witness and tell you what I'm about to tell you, but I do know that when my, bro my sister was two, my brother was four, and I was six, my mom began nursing school. Two, four, and six, and she decided she was going to start nursing school. Now, I've done some college in my day, and I know that college isn't easy. But I can't imagine two, four, and six. Now, my babies were small when they were in school, but I didn't have three. The other key factor is I did have my wife around. My dad wasn't around when my mom was in school. In fact, when we were three, five, and seven, she said she began to start the hardest classes in her nursing degree. Not only that, that's when my dad actually left and was living in Colorado. And you know some of those courses, you know, you've got the, the algebras, you've got the chemistry courses, you've got the anatomy courses, and you've got lots of stuff that's just fun. Yeah, you get it, not really fun, right? But I remember her telling me that when the clinicals begin to start, she'd get up at 4 a.m. in the morning trying to prepare for classes while we were still asleep. And there'd be nights that she'd have to stay up late and they'd have to go in and they'd have to study the charts. It was different back then. Of course, that was 40, oh, well, maybe 37 years ago. Let's just do that. You can do the math to probably how old I was. I'm the oldest, so if I was seven, there you go. You kind of get it that way. But it was difficult, she said. And she said there were times that she just felt like quitting, times when she was sitting in her bed at night that she'd cry herself to sleep, times when she didn't know how she would continue to go on, times when she didn't know how she was going to provide for her family. She said we were poor, we were on food stamps, we didn't have, she would, I, remember, I do remember this part of it, unfortunately, but my mom would make our own clothes, and we were pretty stylish, I guess you, we thought, we didn't know any better then, but I can remember seeing some of those pictures when we grew up of the, the clothes that my mom would make, did y'all ever make your kids clothes thank you mom but I don't know about all that but she would she would back then we would we had the same pair of shoes that we wore for everything and she'd just clean them up wash them up polish them bleach the shoestrings so it looked like we had new stuff but we never had new stuff for very long you know what I'm saying same pair of shoes that I played baseball in same pair of shoes that I played basketball in and so on and so forth and so she would tell me about this and those challenges because the times that she would 
she would just struggle. She didn't have anything really outside to turn to. She was just kind of stuck in the middle of it. And I was like, you know, Mom, well, how, how, um, how did you do it? Like, what kept you going when you felt like quitting? And she said, you know, Dusty, we were so poor that I really wanted something better for our family. And I was determined. She said, I, when I started, I told my mom and dad, don't ever encourage me or, you know, let me quit. I've got to do this for my family. And yet she told me times of how her mom would try to talk her out of it because she would see the challenges that her daughter was going through. And this difficult time in your life, you, you can imagine what, what that's like. And you, you have to understand the, the why of it and the challenges that we, we face in this. And there are many things that happened throughout my childhood. You know, baseball is probably my favorite sport. I love playing baseball. You know, I was an all-conference uh, baseball player and basketball player. I was also an all-area catcher. So catcher was my thing. But I can remember how my mom would run us, run us, run us. You know, I wonder, yeah, I, looking back, I didn't really understand all of what was happening when she would run us to this place, run us here. We'd play in different leagues, and I'd go from this one to go play on this traveling team. And, you know, I really didn't understand. I just loved to go, and I wanted to go. And any time that I felt like we weren't going to go, you know, I had my attitude like most young kids do. And now that I'm coaching and my kids are playing, I realize the sacrifice it takes for that. And so as I, I think about some of the lessons that I learned from my mom and I learned from the things, and you know my testimony, my mom and dad got a divorce when I was going into my junior year of high school, so I was young, watching my mom scramble, watching my mom try to keep everything together together in the midst of this. And what I want you to hear this morning is not every lesson is taught with words. I know there were times that my mom sat me down and we had conversations and she poured wisdom into my life. But the best lessons that I learned from my mom were made through observations. Watching my mom taught me much about what I do not remember when I was six years old. Watching her desire to overcome, to not be a quitter. No matter what life threw at her, she was determined not to quit. And if I was going to reflect some of those life principles, I have to come to a place and say that Dusty's not going to be a quitter. Some of those lessons I know that, you know, when there's no money, no outside support, no ideal circumstances, I need to know the why behind what I'm doing. You know, spiritual lessons that I begin to extract from some of this this morning is that if you have not defined the why, if you've not defined the why in your reasoning behind what you, do with, what you do when you do it, you're going to come to a place of uncertainty. You're going to come to a place of shaky ground. There won't be a foundation underneath of you to continue to compel you to go forward. My mom had defined the why, so when she felt like quitting, she fell back on the reason why she was doing what she was doing. Because every one of us are going to come to the hard place in our life, and if you don't understand the why, it's easier to throw in the towel. It's easier to throw in the towel. I love the quote by Isaac Newton that says, If I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. If I've seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And by observing my mother, I could say today, the reason why I would give you a title, Mama Didn't Raise No Quitter, because I'm standing on the shoulders of someone who refused to give up, regardless of what was in front of her, regardless of her money situation, regardless of her circumstances, regardless if she had any support or help or encouragement, she was determined not to quit. And so I want to talk to you today about persevering. I want to talk to you about not throwing in the towel. The Bible talks about five different types of crowns that believers will receive. But what I have learned about these crowns the Bible mentions is that crowns are formed in the crucible. Crowns are formed in the crucible. The Bible talks about the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the imperishable crown or one that is everlasting. And then he talks about a victor's crown. But none of these crowns shall be attained if we don't finish the race 
that's before us. And as I know and you know from a little bit of life's experience, there will be crucible moments in your life that will ultimately begin to shape and form the crown you will receive when you finish the race, you have fought the good fight of faith, and Jesus says to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Crowns are formed in the crucible. I want you to get that in your spirit this morning. There are two crowns that I want to mention before we get deep into the heart of our message this morning, and that is the imperishable crown, the one that lasts forever. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize, because mama didn't raise a quitter. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. The imperishable crown. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. There is an imperishable crown, one that will last forever, but you are going to have to endure some stuff to receive it. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to dig in. You're going to have to know the why, and you're going to have to remind yourself that your mama didn't raise no quitter. There's going to be times when nobody else is around. You don't have a single resource but what God has put within you and the things that he has given us to keep on keeping on. And that leads me to the victor's crown, which Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 tells me about. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, don't throw in the towel. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Don't give up, he says. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. But you got to keep on keeping on. Come on, you with me this morning. You're hearing the message already. Crowns are formed in the crucible. You know, what is a crucible? What happens there? You know that a crucible is a container, generally either a ceramic or a metal container, where metal is melted, it is heated with extreme temperature. These metals are subjected to it with the purpose of what? Purifying the metal, removing the impurities from the metals. And so in the crucible, this is the place of separation. It separates the good from the bad. And so when I tell you that crowns are formed in the crucible, your life is going to be in the crucible from time to time. There, the good from the bad will be separated in this place. In fact, the Bible tells me that in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, listen, as fire tests the purity of silver and gold, so the Lord tests the heart. Your heart is going to be tested. You are going to be tested in the crucible. And what happens first in the crucible is what I call the melting process. If you're writing stuff down this morning, write down that crowns are formed in the crucible. Write down the melting process because every one of us are going to find ourselves in the melting process where the good and the bad are going to be separated. The melting process is the place that we begin to ask the most deep. Gabriel does this to me. Gabriel does this. It's right before he's about to go to bed that he asks the deepest theological questions. And he doesn't come up with the little ones. It's the big dogs. But when you're in the melting process, this is the place that you begin to ask the deepest theological questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Does God really exist? And if he does, does God really love me? Does God really care? How can I really know these things? When you're in the melting process, you begin to ask yourself, do I really believe all of this stuff that I believe? I 
I'm going to tell you a time in my personal life. It's not really too spiritual at all. But I have a late July birthday. And so growing up, I always had to play with the older kids. When I was going into my junior year, I was just turning. I was 15, go through the year, turn 16 after I finished my junior year. So I graduated high school at 17. But it was preseason summer training for my senior year. Now, as I've told you before, we were uh, Southern Indiana basketball, not class basketball. You all have seen the movie Hoosiers. So we always grew up playing the big schools, and the big schools always just destroyed us. Every sectional, they just annihilated us. In fact, in the history of my school, we only ever had won four sectionals. We'd only ever beat that team four times. But I can remember early on in that summer that the co one of the coaches brought me aside. And, you know, I was only about, I'm about 6'3", but I, I graduated high school 165 pounds. And so I, I weigh a, a good little bit more than that now. I was, a little, I, was, I was little. I wasn't very big. And so the kids were older than me, so I couldn't really hold my position well, but I could shoot really well. One of the coaches comes to me and says, we're going to need you this year. We're going to need you to step up. We're going to need you to be counted on and depended on. And so uh, I had pray, played varsity my junior year as well. But uh, now was the time that I was going to move into a starting role. And I was going to move into a shooting forward role. And he begins to walk me through how they were going to depend on me. And, and I was beginning to process through this. You know, I'd never really been in that kind of a leadership role. And practices began. And what I didn't know that was going to come with this thing that sounded so good, we're going to depend on you to be our three-point shooter. We're going to depend on you. We're going to run our offense. That sounded great. Sounded wonderful. But I didn't know what came with that until practices started. And it seemed like I was the only one they ever yelled at. It seemed like I was the only one that ever was pushed to the point of quitting. And there was one day that I felt like quitting. In fact, I walked off the court. I was done. He just was relentless. The coach was nonstop on me about everything, and I was ready to throw in the towel. I didn't want any more to do with all of it. Forget it. I don't want to be that person. One of the kids that had been, he was, he was bigger, older, he came in, was talking to me, you know, encouraged me in the locker room, going through all this stuff. I'm, I'm about to the place of tears, and we're, we're wrestling, wrestling with all this stuff. And quickly I begin to learn a lesson that if you're going to do something great, if you're going to accomplish something bigger than yourself, you're going to have to be pushed to the place of failure. And you're going to have to get comfortable at that place of failure because if you've really never failed at anything, you've really never pushed yourself, tried hard enough because it's when we fail that we know we pushed ourselves beyond what we can do. See, we like to stay back at that place where everything is comfortable for us. We don't really like to jump out of the boat and wonder what's going to happen. We'd rather just sit back and watch somebody else do it. And it was that moment in my basketball time that I was pushed to the limit and it was from that day on that I began to continue to rise up, work harder, push myself beyond what I could push myself to do. And we went on to win sectionals. We went on to regionals. I was a leading scorer on my team that year. But I don't think it would have happened had I not determined the why for me. Had I not really come to that place where I had to search deep within my soul, I probably would have never pushed myself as far as I pushed myself in that season. I'm only telling you that only to know that you have to come to a place in the melting process where things get so hard, so difficult, that stuff begins to come out of us that you really don't like. I didn't like the feeling of looking like I was a quitter. I didn't like the feeling of crying before my peers. I didn't look, I didn't like how that made me feel. But it was when I got to that place that I realized I could do more than what I thought I could do. You see, the melting process teaches us to enlarge our pain capacity. 
When you're in that crucible, it teaches you to enlarge your pain capacity. Like falling teaches us to get back up again. That pain teaches us that I can handle more than I thought I could handle. Failure taught me what didn't work. Betrayal taught me how to be a better friend, a leader, and a better husband. Weakness taught me about strength. And lonely nights begin to teach me what a bright sunrise really was. See, it's when you get to those places, friends, that you realize the work that God is doing within us. Did you know you had an ugly button? An ugly button. You know, that button that somebody can push to bring the ugliness out of us? Come on, you all got a button, and it just takes the right person, the right moment, the right situation to bring that ugly junk out of us. You got an ugly button. You can get triggered. Bet you all didn't know you had a straw that broke the camel's back button either. And that's a big button because you got to write a lot of stuff on it. You, it's not just like the ugly button. You don't need a lot of room to write on it. But the straw that broke the camel's back button is a big one, and it seems like everything can hit it because you feel like you can't handle no more. You broke. You can't take it anymore. And it just seems like if one more thing comes, and it always comes, the ugly button the straw that broke the camel's back button. But our text tells us, and not only that, but we glory in tribulation. Troubles, trials, because troubles and trials bring us into the melting process, and tribulation, the Bible tells us, produces perseverance. You have to be pushed to the place of failure. You have to be pushed to the place of quitting to know you can actually persevere. You need lonely nights. You need to fall. You need to be weak so you can understand, like Chantal was telling us earlier, that until you realize that God is all you got, right? You realize that God is all I need. Come on, can you? Will you? Will you stay in the game? Will you stay the course? Will you continue on when it gets difficult? Come on, even after the ugly button's been pushed and you saw some stuff in you that you didn't like, come on, will you stay on the ice when it's costly? Will you do these things? Come on, when the temperature gets turned up in your life, what are you going to do? Some of you already know what the temperature's been like. But I'll tell you what I found, the trials bring me to a place for the heart check. Trials show me what's in my heart. Like the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of y'all get so shocked that you said something that you said. It was just our mouth telling on our heart. Come on, my mouth tells on me all the time. Your mouth tells on you. It shows what's out here. So trials bring me to a place of a heart check. So we have the melting process and then we have the molding process. Romans tells us that tribulation produces perseverance, and then perseverance produces this thing called character. See, there's a point to all this. It's not just that I'm not going to give up, I'm not going to throw in the towel, see how hard and strong I can be, see how far I can push myself. No. It's not just about how much you can handle. It's about the character that is developed through the process, and this is the molding process. And when you are formed in the crucible, it's not just about breaking you down. It's about something that God is doing within us. And this is the process where the form of the object begins to take place. When the metal is put into the crucible, it's melted, the impurities come to the top, the ugly button's pushed, the junk comes to the top, and then the goldsmith, the person working with the metal, is going to scrape that junk off the top. He's going to then pour that hot metal into some type of a mold. And he's going to begin to mold it into a shape. And so as this is happening, the thing is, is that only the person working with the metal knows the shape he wants the metal to be. Only that silversmith, only that goldsmith, only the one who's fashioning this metal knows what it is to look like. 
He knows what is necessary. He knows exactly what Dusty needs to develop and form what Dusty needs. God knows what I need to go through. God knows what I need to experience to become the man of God that he's called me to be. God knows exactly what you need when you need it. He does. This idea in our text of perseverance carries with it the meaning to be steadfast, staying in a place, to remain. In fact, it pictures properly resisting pressure. The key is properly resisting the pressure. The Greek bearing up under. So when the trial, the storm comes, the individual stays put. So it's not just to persevere, but it's to remain in a place. And so I remind you this morning that when we remain in a place, you are remaining in Christ. So the spiritual application of all of this, and not only that, but we glory, we rejoice in tribulation. Because when we go through stuff, the tribulation will produce perseverance. It teaches me to stay put. Trials give me an opportunity to stay the course. Trials give me an opportunity to persevere in Christ. Because a lot of times, when the heat gets turned up, we'll do one of two things. We'll either run away or we'll stay put. And crowns are formed in the crucible. Only when we stay put, only when we remain steadfast, only when we persevere will we receive the crown of life, the victor's crown. And I remind you again and again and again that you can't get there without going through here. You can't get there without going through here. If every time something comes your way, you run away from it, you can't get where you're going because you've not persevered under the thing that you're facing. Crowns are formed in the crucible. And I remind you something, that you learn to trust through the pain. When the pain got harder, when the pain got more difficult, you learn to trust in ways that you couldn't learn it any other way. You learned you could overcome in spite of the walls that continued to stand. When the wall didn't fall like you thought it would, you learned to stand. You learned to overcome. And might I remind you, like the song that I was listening to that said, your scars remind you that Jesus was a healer. And I learned from the Apostle Paul that I can have joy even behind prison doors. Come on, it was when the doors shut that I learned I can still have joy. The prison doors can't steal my joy. But until the doors shut, he couldn't learn that there was still a presence of God in a place that you thought he might not be. You can't get there without going through here. The crucible taught us things the mountaintop couldn't. And it became the tool to shape me into the man that I'm becoming today the woman that you're becoming today come on come on Jeannie Mayo says that pain is often the passageway to our promotion pain is often the passageway to our promotion and I'll just tell you that when you're faithful in the little things he'll make you ruler over many and when you can handle this you can handle that If I couldn't handle that coach getting all up in my business, if I couldn't handle him pushing me to that limit, there's no way that when the last few seconds were on the clock that he could trust me. You've got to be pushed to that limit. Mama didn't raise no quitter. I'm going to invite the worship team to join me on the platform. Leads me to my last point. The masterpiece, the finished product. You see, the word that's used for character in our text is a word that means tested in battle. Tested in battle. One that is trustworthy, reliable. In addition, it's a word that is used to describe metal after it has been purified. It pictures everything that is base or impure, and now it's been purged of all that junk Character, integrity, I've been tested, I've been pushed, and all of the ugly button stuff is coming out of me, and God is healing it and making it into something good. And you all know what I'm about to tell you, but how does the goldsmith goldsmith know 
when the metal is just as he wants it to be. When he looks into it and he can see his own reflection. When he looks into that metal and he can see his reflection in it. And I remind you of this spiritual lesson that when the master goldsmith, Jesus himself, looks at you and I, does he see his reflection? Because those troubles and trials that you're facing, they weren't just so you could go through some stuff. God was working in you. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, whom he foreknew. He also predestined to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. Don't waste your pain. Don't waste the trouble. Don't waste the trial. God is doing something in you that will display Christ in us. The master goldsmith, Jesus himself, wants to know, does he see himself in us? You see, we become like that which we behold. We become like that which we set our eyes on. When we begin to set our eyes on Jesus, we become like Jesus. I want to kind of bring this to a close, and if our ushers could get in place, we're going to close with communion today. But I got one point I want you to hear this morning before we bring this to a close completely. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and the first part of the 45th verse says this. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true, ch true children of your Father in heaven. Your actions, loving your enemy, praying for those who persecute you. When you do this, he says, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. John chapter 1, verse 12 says... But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Now there are two references to children of God, child of God in our text. One is a Greek word, huios. And this is the son that begins to take on the likeness of his father. Come on, you know, you've seen how your children begin to act like you. They begin to talk like you. They begin to use words like you. They see what we do, and they begin to act that way. And that's the word huios. That's the word that's used for us who act like our Father in heaven. But then there's the Greek word technon which is meaning a son by mere birth. Those who accept him become children of God. So we are born again, and we become a child of God. Once everybody just receives the communion, just hold your communion and we'll take communion together. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No 
So I want you to catch this point. I want to reiterate it again. Two places in the scriptures where child of God is referenced. The Greek word huios is used to describe the one who acts like their father in heaven. They see what their father in heaven does and they respond by doing the same thing. Then the Greek word for technon is one who is merely a child by fact of birth. And so we have a spiritual birth, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. So there is the spiritual birth where we become technon, a child of God. And then there is when we act like our Father in heaven, that we are the huios, the child of God, because we have acted like our Father in heaven. When we begin to go through the melting process, when our lives are being purified in the crucible, God is taking things out of us that are contrary to who he is, and he is forming us to take on the huyats, that we are a son or a daughter because we act like our Father in heaven. And I made a comment to you earlier on that there are many lessons that we can learn from the words that people speak to us, but we also see what we learn from others by how and what they do. And when we come to communion, there is so much that I've learned from Jesus because of what he said, but how much I've learned because of what he did. And when we come to the Lord's table, we see what Jesus did. For three and a half years, he taught us. He spoke. But then there was what he did. There was what he did. And when he sat with the 12, and he took the bread, and he said, this is my body given for you. He was revealing what he was about to do. He was demonstrating, as Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, that God loves us. And so can we hold up the bread this morning? Jesus, we learned so much from what you said. But in your body, we observe how to reflect what it means to be a huios, child of God. Thank you for your sacrifice, O oh Lord. May we live sacrificial. Now, God, in this message for us today, may we persevere like you persevered. May we keep on keeping on in the body like you did. And so as we take together, we do so thanking you, doing in remembrance as you did. We're not giving up. We're not quitters. Let us take together the bread today in Jesus' name. Then he took the cup, and he said, this was my blood, which would be shed for you. The ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate demonstration of his love, the depth of his love, his sacrifice and commitment to us. And can we hold this up this morning as well? Lord Jesus, your blood represents the greatest love that anyone could demonstrate, and that you laid down your life for us. And so this morning as we participate, as we partake of what you provided for us, may we find physical strength, spiritual strength to persevere as you persevered this morning in Jesus' name. Let us take the cup together. Can I ask us to 
stand again and sing that chorus one more time. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. No turning back. Come on, I'll remind you this morning that Mama didn't raise no quitters. You're not a quitter. Keep on keeping on. Don't throw in the towel even when it gets difficult. Know that God is working in you for a purpose. Amen. Don't waste your pain. Don't waste the challenges. Don't give up. You can do this. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your people as they go. Watch over them. Keep them. And may they continue to persevere even when it gets difficult. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. I hope it blessed and encouraged you. Click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And let me encourage you, consider giving to support the ministries of Gateway Church. You can do that by texting 77977 and then put GW Shreve in the text box. Also, download our app in the App Store, Gateway Church Shreveport. Share this with your friends and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.